What makes a movie set fun? Like, are they all fun or are some more tense than others? Certainly. I mean, as much as I enjoyed Rambo, Rambo was a tense set because it was just it was very physical and lots of um, endless action. I mean, you know, when I read that script, I think it was 80, 84 pages of mayhem. It was 85 pages of mayhem. I read it in 1984. I read it right after Karate Kid came out, and I knew I'd have to follow something that would make that kind of money. It was a good, grossing idea, even though I was on Cagney and Lacey. So I remember reading Rambo. It was 85 pages of mayhem. It was just, you know, Sly had nine lines, and we were friends, and, and I, I ended up doing it. But sometimes there are sets tense like this, and sometimes like just finishing VFW or doing the Tarantino movie. You couldn't, you know, those places were so much fun. VFW's, v, uh, Stephen Lang and William Sadler and David Patrick Kelly and Fred Williamson, and all we did was laugh hmm. because we had to create a camaraderie that existed back in Vietnam. So now we all die in this movie, but the thing is it's an action piece. It's a little bit of horror, and we have so much fun. And when does that come out? It'll be out. It's in Cannes now, oddly enough. Oddly enough, that's in Cannes being sold, while today is, is the, um, the premiere of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in Cannes today, which is great. And another trailer dropped today, too. I know that because a lot of people were talking about it um, around here, too. They were talking about how good it looked. When you're up for a Tarantino movie, how, what does that feel like? And how does that just, you know, walk me through that process. Are you just like... Yeah, no matter what, right away, or do you yeah, still... That's it. Yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, because, it, you know, it doesn't matter. There are people who work for Tarantino, and they don't care if they have any lines. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't matter who that actor could be, a big-time actor. It's just, um, I had been bugging him for years to be part of something. And uh, because I love Western so much, I wanted Django, then I wanted Hateful Eight. But, he, you know, Cat knows what he wants. Mm -hmm. And then he offered me this piece in the small piece with DiCaprio, but it's great, it's sort of Western. And, um, and uh, I had the greatest time, the greatest time. He's just so much fun to work for, and he's such a film buff, and he knows everything you've ever done. Every little show that you did in the 70s that you guest starred on, Charlie's Angels, this, that, he knows. And it's great, but just to give you a little sense of it, he finishes the day, and he says, I think I got it, but I want one more, meaning takes. Turns around to his 100 character crew and says, and why? And everybody screams in unison, because we love to make movies. <laughs> you get a tingle up your spine, you'll do anything for this guy. Yeah. You know. He just has that much passion for, for yeah, making he movies. Just, he just has that much passion as a filmmaker. And, you know, he's just, he's a big kid. So you grew up in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. And how long were you in Brooklyn for before you left? I lived in Brooklyn until I was 12, and then we were, I moved to Queens. I was bar mitzvahed back in Brooklyn, I remember. But we lived in Queens. And then I left to go into the city to study. You know, I was working with a classical repertory company and, and Lincoln Center and Cafe La Mama and a variety of places. And... Um, just went back and went into the city, left home, and and it, it was you know, the, he just worked in the village and did lots of plays and mostly plays, very little film. Do you enjoy theater? I love theater. I'm going to see To Kill a Mockingbird after I see you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, how could yeah. how, how could you how, this experience? How could anything compare to nothing? Yeah, you know, it'll be downhill once I leave this room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even how many your IMDb you had on your website. It says eighty, but I feel like it's more than that now. Like just in terms of theater and movies and TV, I feel like it's got to be pushing the hundred at this point, right? You mean movies? Just I, I feel well, like. But everybody. some of that stuff is it's TV guest star. You know, you know, you, know, you I don't think you don't think about that because that was like a training ground at the beginning when you came here. You know, I came here in '74, and you know I. I, I was lucky. Within two years, I had my own series that was about a lifeguard and a fireman and a policeman called Kodar. And um, it only lasted one season. And 
then, you know, I got to do a comedy right after that, um, a Mary Tyler Moore spin-off, um, Mary Tyler Moore Productions. And so it was okay. I think the greatest thing that came out of all that was I got to buy 11 acres of a ranch and have horses. And, you know, this New York guy comes and within two years of living in California, I was able to go out to Agora, which is an inland of Malibu, and buy 11 acres and have horses and not worry about playing my stereo too loud so the Brooklyn neighbors will say, turn it down, you know, <laughs> crank up the soundtrack of Star Wars and the good, the bad, the ugly, and I was in heaven, you know. So was acting the only route you were going to take? Like there was no other options? Yeah, there were no options. I mean, in the fourth grade, I realized that I liked making people laugh. And it was a silly little play, The Golden Goose. And I remember feeling really good inside and what it did for me. And I just went from year to year doing plays. I don't think I did anything about it really professionally till I was, I guess I was like 23. And I would go to class and all and work at Lincoln Center and after I was 23. And I took it seriously once I moved into Manhattan. But, you know, it was, um, it was always interesting. I used to audition for plays at universities that I wasn't even in, in attendance of. But they didn't know if they were big enough for school, like Queens College or whatever. I would go there and they were doing a play I wanted to do and I would audition and I'd get the part and no one would even know that I wasn't in attendance, <laughs> you know, because they had a good drama department. You do you know. watch your work? Do you watch uh, your movies or the TV, uh, TV series? Yeah, and, and nine or ten times I, I, don't, I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't <laughs> like to watch myself. And I, I get, Billy and I talk about this all the time where we get picky. We don't like our hair. We don't like the moments. We don't like the, and then once they're put together and cut, you really feel that's what's so good about working with these, these writers. They really they direct, they cut, they you know produce, they rewrite. And I remember Billy saying, after the season's over, you'll see all the moments that you weren't comfortable with will look fine, and some of them will be terrific, and. Unquestionably, that's happened to me. So were you hesitant about coming back to reprise uh, Sensei Crease on Cobra Kai, or was it, you know, did you have to be talked into it, coerced, or were you just, you know, kind of on the fence all along, and then you, got, you jumped in? I, I was on the fence, you know. I mean, I really wanted to meet them, and um, Ralph and Billy were, were recruited first, and then they said we wanted her to come in for episode 10, set up season two, and, um, but, you know, would you do that? And I, I said, yeah, but I really wanted to have the character and have different colors, different textures. I didn't want it to play the stoic, tough guy. And I was interested in doing that. And they said they were planning on doing that and using his background and a lot of emotional activity, different than the emotional activity from the, the movies, where he was just hard yeah. and cold. And... They knew more about our characters, I believe, than any of the, than the three of us. We, they just knew so much. They had seen this movie when they were six. And then they just planned and planned and wanted to make a continuation of, Kara, of Karate Kid, but not make a sequel, make a whole story about 30 years later, the lives of these people, the gray lives, mm -hmm. not the black and the white. The gray lives, because everybody's gray. And the kids who watch the show, they love it because they don't see white hats and black hats. Yeah. They identify with the problems of these teenagers. You know, and adults identify with the problems of of Billy, you know, and Ralph. And and then the older ones identify with all the madness that John Kreese brings in. Yeah. You know, which is a very conservative point of view. You know. Yeah, but I like the fact that they, they finally gave you some depth you know, your character, some depth. Uh, mm -hmm. Although you did play the menacing um, sensei well enough to be known for it, you know, what, 30 years later at this point. But it's nice that you do get to fill in those gaps to the story. And, and that now season three, again, it was just announced that it's going to be back for season three. But from, you know, I don't want to spoil anything from season two, but you can just tell that your character is going to be a central part to that. Um, and that's really cool because it just, there's a lot, there's still a lot to be told, I feel like, a lot to fill in. And look, I, my wife and I, we had this marked on our calendars. Like we had alerts set. 
And like, you know, we, we were all about it. So we crushed that. And we had a five, we have a five month old and when she'd cry, like we, you know, we'd quickly feed her, but it was kind of like you know, hurry up and fall back asleep so we could get going on the next episode. And uh, yeah, I think what I'm trying to say is we're not that great of parents. Yeah. <laughs> You are, you are. <laughs> I mean, just think the baby's a substitute to a brilliant TV series. So it's second place. Yeah. It's, you know, it's right there up on the top. Yeah. You know, top, top five, <laughs> you know. But, I mean, what, your takeaway, did you, I mean, when you read, um, when, when, they, when they talk you into it, and you, did you read the script or, like, uh, for season one and then see when you would come back and then say, yeah, man, I'm in. Like, this is going to take off? Or were you still kind of skeptical? Like, oh, who knows, but I'll do it. Why they, not? They, they write... They get ideas, they throw them around, because I just asked the same question you did about season three, you know, and they couldn't tell me very much. Uh, you know, they hint it's a little, like when I went with a lot of my information um, about my backstory, they already had it. We sat and had lunch, I had a legal pad of notes that I went to chat with, you know, about army rangers in Vietnam and, you know, and they, they had it, you know, they had a lot of things that I had worked hard on for a backstory and brought it to them because all I had done was one episode. The real story's only just begun, yeah. you know. And then now they get picked up for season two and I wanted to be part of it. And they, you know, they just told me to sit tight and they work slow. And then all of a sudden it all explodes and they write the script, but they hash around ideas a lot. And uh, you have to trust them because everything they conceived to work really worked. And you know, out in Hollywood, people can tell you so many things. And it, nine out of ten times, it doesn't happen the way they perceive it to happen. It doesn't happen the way they document it to happen. And here it does, which is quite amazing. You know, for three guys who wrote Harold and Kumar and Hot Tub Time Machine, then all of a sudden they go run the show. Mm -hmm and they're doing, wearing all these hats, and they're wearing all these hats with fur and fine brims, every one of them, because they you know what they're doing. That trust, is that something that you had to learn? Um, I just feel like that would be really hard. As an actor, you're putting a lot into what you're doing, and then you kind of have to give it over to, to other people, to, to, as you said before, like mold and put together and find the best pieces. Doesn't it ever concern you that they're gonna pick not the best pieces, and then your performance suffers because of that, or at least perceived performance because of what the people see on screen may not be really what you put out. Well, th there are times when some scenes really mean something to you, and, and then at times you think one take will be what someone will use because it was your most expressive and you were the most passionate and you were on the money and the most subtle. And at times I find that from the point of view of a director, because I have directed, point of view of a director, that he'll see the scene, the focus of the scene differently than you do. So despite how brilliant you think you were in a certain take, we may, we may want to see that off, hear that off camera. It's more effective if that, what I'm saying that I think I'm so brilliant with, it's subtle to Billy, that may be better on, on, on literally just as a voiceover and Billy coming down a corridor, which, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually citing an, an example where I'm on the phone in one of those episodes saying, hey, you know, um, uh, I'm screaming and yelling in the phone and I really thought they were gonna put the camera on me, but they kept the camera on Billy coming down into his office to hear me do all this. Mm -hmm. And it was an integral part because the words were more important than the acting. I was trying to, I was bluffing with saying, you know, I'm in a hotel and I was having a problem with the Sheridan and uh, the, the maid stole my watches and all that. I live in a halfway house, you know, and what was real important was the information given. But it wasn't on Marty Cove, it wasn't on John Kreese. It was really on Billy. And what was most important was watching him listen coming down the corridor. And I had a half a page of dialogue. And I thought, oh, it's, you know, I worked on and worked. What was valid when I saw the thing was it was very true. It wasn't important to see me. It was important to hear me, just to hear me, because he is now not sensing that something's correct with what John Creese says about his life is great, 
he's living at the Sheridan. It doesn't ring true. He wouldn't be screaming at the, at the Sheridan manager. And then he follows me and he sees I live in a halfway house. So it all kind of builds and falls into place when you go behind the camera and you see it objectively. As an actor, it's tricky. What do you prefer? Do you like to act the most? Do you like to direct? Or do you like to kind of jump around? I, you know, I, I've directed, I directed Silk Stockings down, you know, when it was on TV and directed a lot of theater. But it's such a massive responsibility to direct. You have to be in control of every department. You know, you're responsible for wardrobe, you're responsible for props, you're resp I mean, overall, yeah. you have department heads, but unquestionably, you've got to have the vision of the entire piece. And um, it might be a young man's game. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great, because actors make, as far as I'm concerned, actors make the best directors. Because we know what it's like to work with someone who doesn't give direction. And if you don't get direction, because we all want direction, we all want to be led and acknowledged and loved. And if you're not working with someone who gives you that, it's a drag. Mm -hmm. And so as actors, when you are directing, you know that you can't allow a la an act and allow the character's life without giving that as guidance. Mm -hmm. Did you um, change up your like health and fitness regimen to, to dust off the ghee for since they crease again, did you change anything up? Did you hit the heavy bag, or did you know, anything change in you? All like, of the above. Yeah? Yeah, we worked out, Billy and I worked out for a couple of months before going, because we knew we had that fight in episode one. And so, but we didn't know what kind of fight. You know, we didn't know how intense it would be. So, you know, we did a lot of the basics, and Billy was in great shape, because he had, you know, worked nine episodes previously in, in the show, and, and um, I kind of didn't have anything in, in episode 10, really. But episode one, season two, is a direct cut. Mm -hmm. So we worked on some of the moves, moves once we got the move from the stunt coordinator. But we didn't have a lot of time. We had maybe th two weeks once we knew the, what to work on physically. Otherwise, we were just working out with general you know, basics. Uh, and w when we were down there, we had a, a week or two to play. But on this year we have a day, one day more per episode because the action sequences, as you saw in episode 10, yeah. 15 minutes of a fight, yeah. those kids were brilliant. We watched it last night, episode 10. And um, kids are brilliant. And you need time so that nobody gets hurt because everybody's going ho in this cast. So the answer is we don't get the time Chad got in John Wick, John, in, in John Wick, got six months to prep, you yeah. know. We get six minutes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you pulled it off, I mean, so. Pulled it off, but you, got, you, you really got to, like I start working out now with a trainer and we don't go back to work until probably August 20th. But you, you have to couple working out with the trainer while and doing some karate. You've got to do it, you've got to play. And you've got to go to the dojo, and that's what your diet has to be. Yeah. And you, you have to prepare, because once you're there, it's labor. You're working 12, 14 hours a day, and you know, you're know you doing block shooting, which means everything happens in the dojo for the next two episodes. You're going to shoot. And everything that happens on the street for two episodes, you shoot. And so you work hard. Yeah. What's left for you that you want to really, really do that like has kind of been either lingering or that you've, I wouldn't say put off, but like that's, you know, that you really want to go after in your career. You've done everything. I mean, you've, you've done every type of medium there is, but so what's left? I want to make a Western with my son about an old gunfighter and a young gunfighter. Would you be the young gunfighter? Yeah, I'd be the young <laughs> gunfighter. And, um, you know, the plastic surgery, you know. <laughs> but honestly, you know, we've seen that story before. We've seen, you know, the young kid, you know, Brandon DeWilder and Shane Allen Ladd, and the young kid wants to be like the old gunfighter because he's tough and courageous, and the old gunfighter has, you know, doesn't want to be a gunfighter anymore, doesn't want to lead that life anymore. There's no, like in the Magn Magnificent Seven, they say, you know, they, they go through a whole line of what you don't have in life by being a gunfighter. You have no friends. You have no family, of course you have no enemies, you know. 
And the bottom line is, I, I, I'm searching to find a through line where we don't do the stereotype of what I've just mentioned, but find something between a, a father and his son. And the father is an old gunman and a real emotional story between the two of them where the child, and I haven't found this yet, and I haven't figured out how to write it, but where the child, truly something happens where he learns from his father's mistakes, but it's something that's very pertinent to today's society because you can't write black hats and white hats anymore. Right. Kids are too hip. Mm -hmm. Kids are so sophisticated now. That's why Cobra Kai works, because it's all gray. Right. And, and you can't write the Western anymore that way. And unless you have a really good story, a Western won't sell. And that is, to me, the heritage of American cinema is the Western. And I believe that it can come back, and it's one of my dreams, to rejuvenate it. You know, Costner does it all the time in all his movies. Yeah. It doesn't even matter if it's a contemporary picture. It's a Western, you know. Yeah. He does it. And there are elements in there that's all about America and pioneering and adventure and what we were, you know, 100 years ago. And, I mean, I was born way too late, man. I, you know, <laughs> if I was born about 1910, I figured I could have done all the pirate movies, Captain Blood, Errol Flynn stuff. Could have done all the westerns in the 30s and the 40s, you know? But there'd be no internet. There'd be no, no internet, that's no, right. I wouldn't have this conversation. <laughs> no, no. Mm -hmm. no, but you were in Wide Earp with Kevin Costner. Yeah. How, what was that experience like? The best. Yeah? Just because it was the Western and it was, was it just because of the whole, like it was something that you really wanted to be a part of or was it just an enjoyable experience? No, it's something, I mean, I, I was friends with him and, and, you know, and I loved what he did in Silverado. And um, I remember, um, yeah, I remember for Silverado, it was brought up to Brian Dennehy and myself. And Brian Dennehy got the part. And then I remember... Um, Sent, uh, getting a letter from Larry Kasdan saying, and this is 1985, 86, while I was on Cagney and Lacey, and he said, I'm sorry, we've gone a different way with the character. Next time, I promise you'll be on my team. You'll ride on my team. That was 1985. 94, he's doing Wide Earp. Hmm. And Kevin and, and I were friends, and so I got pretty much did that part. I really wanted Michael Madsen's role, which is Virgil Earp. Right. And um, uh, I got, Larry calls me, he says, no, I want you to do this part, and you're going to be in the trailer. I said, the trailer is a year and a half away. How, how are you going to know it's going to be in the trailer? He says, Marty, you're going to be in the trailer. And it was a really cool character, Ed Ross. I have a couple of scenes with Kevin. And um, it was such a good time to work with Larry Kasdan and Larry's direction, I, I'm a gunfighter walking in, calling out Kevin Costner. Costner is 1869, he's working as a mule skinner. He doesn't know that he's wide Earp yet. He doesn't know he has the power. And I just uh, walk in the scene with a smile, Hollywood gunfighter. Larry says, cut, calls me over and he says, I've watched you on Cagney and Lacey. He says, when a perp comes into a liquor store, do they have a big smile on their face? Or do they hold the gun to the cashier and just mean business and want to get out of that store real quick? And I said, that's what they do. He says, you come in here, you mean business, look for this guy and kill it. Turn it that and another scene we did, it was just great. And I cried. I physically cried when I left that set. I did not want to go. You get Randy Quaid, you get Gene Hackman, you, I, in the West, Santa Fe, I didn't want to go home. I could ask a million more questions. I know you got a lot to, to do today. You got a play to get to. You got the, the film festival to get to. Uh, Martin Cove, you are awesome. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks okay, for coming man. by. This is awesome. My really. pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. Really, thank you enough.